clinicians and broader public health surveillance activities so we can advance monitoring and case management. Our department's interagency work group is also examining ways to enhance that surveillance and currently the CDC estimates that only about 10% of new cases of viral hepatitis are reported each year. Two-thirds of states report cases of chronic hepatitis C, but those that do have large backlogs of uninvestigated cases. And so a, a clear picture of the nature and scope of chronic hepatitis C in particular across every state is not readily available. So we plan to uh, uh, have better integration with respect to monitoring hepatitis and then implementing prevention and care programs. And we also want to address the disparities issue uh, especially how this condition affects Asian American and Pacific Islanders and African Americans and at-risk populations uh, such as the homeless, uh, immigrants, injection drug users, and incarcerated persons. So in summary, uh, Mr. Chairman and distinguished committee members, uh, we are very, very grateful to you for holding this hearing. Uh, we all agree on the tremendous burden of this disease on our society. I want to assure you that our department has taken immediate and coordinated steps to reverse the trends that are before us. Uh, we want to work closely together with you and we have a major opportunity with respect to prevention and creating new systems of care. Again, I want to thank my colleague, Dr. Ward, who has done so much critical work in this area and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your, your testimony. Um, really um, appreciate your being here. Based on what you have seen, read, and heard, uh, if we had the resources, uh, can we prevent hepatitis? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think the uh, potential for prevention here is uh, unlimited, and we understand risk, and we understand uh, the trends if we don't act. So we have a, a great opportunity right now with, with your leadership and the work of your committee. Also, I should stress that with the passage of health reform, we have an opportunity to talk about true systems of care and a renewed emphasis on prevention. Uh, prevention involves not just work in the cl clinic, but also in the community. And in this particular case, uh, prevention also focuses on immunization uh, strategies as well. So we, ha we have tremendous opportunities right now. Dr. Ko, if people don't feel sick and don't know they're sick, how can we go about identifying those who are infected? So that's the challenge, Mr. Chairman, of a screening of asymptomatic people. And that's the challenge of prevention, which we are facing much better as a nation. Uh, we have much more commitment and attention from policymakers like yourself, uh, members of the health community, and the general public to advance prevention, testing high-risk groups, and screening. And again, through health reform that has a great prevention focus, uh, we need more attention to developing guidelines for screening and, and testing high-risk groups, and then making those uh, guidelines uh, available uh, for people to understand, and then also covering prevention services so that cost is not a barrier. Right. How bad is the problem of hepatitis? Uh, well, we've heard uh, the, the numbers over and over, up to 5.3 million people infected right now. But the big challenge is that up to three-quarters of people who are infected are unaware they even have the virus. So uh, the, the challenge is catching it early for asymptomatic people, spreading the message that we have good treatments if, if uh, cases are discovered early, sending the message uh, through policymakers like yourself, uh, and really changing the paradigm here with coordinated activity of all of you and then also within our department. Right. As I understand it, the U.S. Preventative Task Force issues a directive to CMS as to what screening and treatment for hepatitis will be covered by Medicare. How can we make sure that the new treatments that are, you say are just over the horizon will be covered by Medicare if the task force issues its directive just before those treatments are ready? 
Well, there are several parts to your question, uh, Mr. Chairman. First of all, um, within Medicare and Medicaid, actually, there are new prevention opportunities afforded by health reform. So that's a very exciting uh, part of this new law. And it gives us an opportunity to look at new prevention and screening strategies in a whole host of areas. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is, just to clarify, an independent advisory group of experts, uh, and they are one of a number of groups that make screening guidelines. So we look to them, but also many other groups to come out with uh, recommendations. So I'm hoping, again, that with this uh, very important timing after health reform, uh, with this hearing and with the establishment of our Department Interagency Working Group, we can bring all these prevention uh, recommendations together and move forward as a country to tackle this major challenge. Right. You know, I just want to clear up one other thing, too, um, that was a statement made in the last uh, in reference to Earmark, you know, my good friend um, who I work very closely with, um, you know, that this would not be an earmark. This would be an expanding, expanding a program that is in existence that needs additional resources in order to accomplish the goals that we all are seeking. So I just want to sort of make that clear. And so what we need to do is just fight to expand the program, which uh, uh, there's no question anybody and everybody you talk to is saying that we need additional uh, resources. I now yield to the gentleman from uh, California, Congressman Bill Bray, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and let me say, Mr. Chairman, as the uh, representative of the 50th District, which has had um, a very checkered past when it comes to earmarks, uh, I think this is one of those issues why we need to really talk about a, uh, a true reform package so boundaries, lines are all drawn, and everybody knows where the rules are. Um, but that aside, I'd like to um, sort of uh, engage the two gentlemen with some observations as a layman. Um, first of all, for the record, I avoided uh, tattoos not because of, of health problems, but because my father, who was a lifer in the Navy, um, assured me that he would um, take care of the tattoo with a rusty razor if I ever came home with one, okay? But I do worry about the fact that I see that mentality not being applied to the next generation um, and that whole acceptance of, of, of certain behavior, some of it, you know, now totally acceptable, but does constitute still expanded risk. I'd like to see what we can do, rather than just talking about how much money we can throw at the problem, which I'm, I think disproportionately we're not getting a fair share of, on this issue. But aside from that, is that um, things like protocols for testing, I would strongly say that we need to get the word out to physicians that um, targeted populations should be looked at um, multidimensional, not just inquiring about behavior, but looking at the population you know, window. When we've got that kind of number, any, any toxicologist, a statistician will tell you, you don't ignore that kind of spike and that kind of opportunity. Um, and so I would, I, first of all, I, let me throw out some ideas as a layman that I'd go into it. Uh, if I was still at the county, I'd be telling our county physicians that you should not be asking them, how have you had risky behavior in the past, whatever, because that automatically sets off defensive mechanisms. Um, and it's, how, it's, it's astonishing how those of us in the 50s and, and, and our, our 60s forget about our good old days um, when um, we lived through the 60s, which most of us can't remember anyways. But if we ask them, we basically look at their age, use the age as initial, still you can follow up on um, behavior for the, for the general population, but as a backup, not necessary, because I just think that you got defenses. And the other issue is, um, right now, and I say this, I had um, the county physician because of a lot of exposure I had as a county supervisor. Uh, the Mexican border was on my district. I spent a lot of time in Mexico, and you know the horrendous problems with hepatitis south of the border. I was inoculated as much as possible at that time. But the treatment now that exists now is an IV treatment that is pretty extensive. It's how many weeks? Uh, up to 48 weeks, right. Okay, yeah. 48 weeks. One of the biggest problems I know, especially at a lot of at-risk population, is that when you talk about that kind of treatment, they may start the treatment, but the problem of finishing the treatment is always a big problem. The same kind of things we run into with, with antibiotics with certain populations. Uh, 
My question is, when you do this, you're doing your evaluation update, your, two, uh, your, your uh, 2004 protocols, uh, are you looking at the new treatments coming down the pike that are being considered, especially, I think there's about three different proposals for oral uh, treatment that is much shorter. And it's a lot different going seven weeks taking a pill than it is going seven weeks going into a, going into a, a physician's facility and getting a shot. Are we looking at the fact of that the treatment effectiveness is going to jump dramatically if any one of these three becomes effective because the treatment of the deal? And, how, and is that going to be considered in our, our, our upgrade? Sure, Congressman. First of all, thank you for your commitment to this. And you know, we want the broadest possible approach here to advance prevention, education, and treatment all at the same time. So. Uh, with respect to the prevention part, uh, there is new uh, effort and research to look at a so-called age-based model for uh, identifying people at risk. And actually, Dr. Ward at the CDC has led that effort, so I'm going to ask him to comment on that in just a second. Uh, and then also, the treatments have advanced quite a bit, as you have noted, and it uh, does have the potential to decrease the duration of treatment quite substantially for patients. So this is all good news uh, coming down um, in the very near future, I hope. And um, we, we want to coordinate better, identifi better identification of people at risk, whether it's risk-based assessment or age-based assessment. And we also want to advance better treatments. But I think Dr. Ward wants to say something about this. Well, good morning. No, I, we share your interest in looking at alternatives to our current strategies for screening. We want our screening approaches to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And right now, we, we have a, a fairly large body of evidence that risk-based approaches represent barriers to people getting screened represent, represent, in, in contrast to presenting opportunities. So what we've embarked upon is looking at an age-based approach, given that, uh, to your point, uh, upwards of about three-quarters of persons living with hepatitis C uh, were born between 1946 and 1964, the, the so-called baby boom generation. Uh, and, that and, the, and, and among that uh, age group, about one out of every um, uh, 30 people, or about 3% uh, of persons in that age group are hepatitis C uh, infected. Um, we would like to, um, and, and we have embarked upon a study uh, known as BESS C to um, to see how we can uh, if this could be easily implementable by physicians. Um, you know, as we've already pointed out um, earlier today, hepatitis C is a major cause of of, um, of liver cancer. We have other age-based prevention strategies for other types of cancer: uh, breast cancer, uh, gastro um, colon cancer. So we would like to see how we could begin to look at hepatitis C screening in the context of cancer prevention and begin to say this is another age-based approach to protect someone's health for the future without requiring someone to, to go way back in the past and say this, this happened, this happened, so then I'm eligible for screening. We'd like to make it much more uh, accessible and much more easily implementable by physicians and in so doing uh, decrease this large proportion of people who currently don't know their status. Yeah, but there is a big is, gentleman's time has expired. I, I appreciate it, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. I just yeah. I just think that this reassess yeah. this assessment from the update of four the four uh, the 2004 and the fact that um, there it's a very complicated issue and I hope sometime we can talk about it about the fact of the difference of um, how expensive treatment is with IV how there's people that will not complete treatment as opposed to the new technologies come down and how that affects the whole formula. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Time is expired. Gentlewoman from California, Dr. Chu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I want to commend you, Dr. Koh, for uh, taking on this disease uh, so strongly. You are the first person in your position to raise this amount of awareness uh, and activity uh, on combating hepatitis B and C. So I, I truly commend you on that. Um, it's a grave concern to me that in the U.S. hepatitis claims more lives each year than HIV AIDS and, and is about 100 times more infectious than HIV, yet only 2 percent of CDC's prevention budget is devoted to hepatitis B and C. And um, 
It's also uh, very uh, disconcerting that Asian Americans are disproportionately impacted by this disease. Um, although APIs make up about 4.5 percent of the population. Okay. Um, even though APIs make up uh, about 5 percent of the U.S. population, they count for more than 50 percent of Americans who are living with the disease. And in fact, it remains a top killer of Asian Americans. Uh, many of the, these um, Asian Americans have immigrated from countries in which uh, they lack universal vaccination. They may have come here without knowledge that they were carrying the disease, and uh, they may have uh, already developed a liver cancer. Pregnant mothers uh, have, can easily transmit the virus to their newborns, and that's how it's being spread. And uh, it's it's so prevalent that in, in the API population, all of us know somebody who is infected. And in fact, recently in my area, the mayor of our local city died because it did develop into liver cancer. Um, so my question is what you are doing uh, to address the particular issues in the Asian American community with with this incredible prevalence of this disease? Well, first of all, uh, Congresswoman, thank you for your leadership on not only this issue, but on so many issues for the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. I have seen your commitment personally, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, you know, we understand that this condition of hepatitis disproportionately affects the Asian American and Pacific Islander population, so we have a, a, a lot of challenges ahead of us, but we also have opportunities uh, one, one opportunity, as you well know, is that the President has established a new White House initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I, I had the great honor of standing with the President when he signed that executive order last fall in the White House. And the first meeting of that uh, commission, which is chaired, co-chaired by Secretary Locke and uh, Secretary Duncan, is uh, next month in July. So we, we're going to put this issue uh, on the agenda there um, to have the, the White House commission uh, address this squarely. Then we're also very lucky to have many leaders in the uh, in the community, from the community health center uh, organizations, uh, advocacy groups, um, outreach efforts um, spearheaded by uh, committed people from Asian American and Pacific Islander backgrounds, very involved here. And then also tremendous research that's going on. And Congressman, you and I attended a uh, very important event where uh, new health data was being released on Asian American populations. Uh, that, was, that was a great event to share in. So there's a, a lot more attention on documenting uh, health concerns in our population and then in mobilizing uh, people who want to make a difference here. Go ahead. Let me just um, add on to say I think some of the critical areas of our prevention efforts as they relate to Asian Americans. Um, include our perinatal hepatitis B prevention program. As you pointed out, uh, mother-to-child transmission is a major mode. Um, it continues to result in transmissions, uh, resulting in hundreds of, of um, infants becoming infected with hepatitis B. Um, many of those are Asian Americans. The number of um, um, women, as noted in our written testimony, um, uh, has increased to about 24,000 per year who are hepatitis B infected giving birth. And currently, our perinatal programs uh, have the capacity to um, um, provide case management services for about 50 percent of those. Um, we have the prevention tools to um, dramatically prevent uh, transmission in this population through vaccination, hepatitis B, immunoglobulin, um, but um, uh, those services have to be available. And, and how are we going to ensure that the resources go towards this sort of effort? Well, again, we are, I think, mobilizing every resource. Having this hearing is a tremendous uh, st statement of commitment from policy leaders across the country. We have this new energy from this uh, department uh, interagency work group. Uh, we have here at the hearing um, many people from community level and advocacy level who, who want to make a difference. Uh, research continues to go forward. And then uh, the health reform passage and implementation, I think, gives us opportunities to, to look at all these issues uh, carefully and build a real system of care. As you heard from Dr. Ward, we're uh, looking more closely on the screening strategies. 
Uh, and there are also new uh, testing uh, technologies that are being explored, uh, rap rapid testing for hepatitis C in particular. I don't know if Dr. Ward wants to say more. Well, I think the other critical areas, um, you know, in general, but as the, particularly as they relate to Asian Americans, is one is um, community awareness and education. Uh, disp you know, despite the high prevalences that you mentioned, uh, awareness appears to be low based on the information we've received. And, um, and we need to correct that so that persons understand the benefits of vaccination and screening and, and early care rather than waiting for liver cancer to develop. And so we, um, we have done um, uh, inventories to identify community organizations who are delivering prevention services for hepatitis B around the country. We've um, provided um, some resources um, to two areas to actually support screening uh, for hepatitis B through those community um, uh, organizations. So that's an important opportunity. The other critical area is provider education. If, if they're not going to a provider that uh, knows what needs to be done for hepatitis, uh, after you've increased their awareness, you really haven't done, you know, a full job. And so we have to link our community education with provider training so that when people go to a physician, that physician knows who should be screened, how to interpret the screening test, which sometimes can be complex, um, and, and then knows how to interpret that test result and determine who needs care and treatment for hepatitis. Well, let me uh, uh, indicate to, um, to the members that we have three votes on. And of course, um, uh, uh, I want to yield to the gentleman from Missouri, and we try to finish up with this panel. Um, and we will resume at 12.15. We'll come back at 12.15. Uh, we'll, Okay, so I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Missouri. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman, and uh, I, I will be more judicious with my five minutes, unlike my colleagues, <laughs> and seeing that there is a vote. <laughs> uh, Dr. Cole, I know that you've, you've been very persistent about developing a, uh, a interagency strategy uh, to address this health crisis. In your view, what are some of the challenges that an initiative uh, like this may face? Well, we have a um, big department that has many responsibilities uh, being put for, before us. Uh, when I arrived at the department last year, we had H1N1 ahead of us, and now, of course, we have health reform implementation. But the opportunity, I believe, is that uh, we have uh, really a, a unique and unprecedented chance to, to make a difference with respect to conditions like hepatitis, uh, with respect to prevention and really building systems of care. Uh, also, if I can say we've had tremendous leaders in the department like Dr. Ward and, and officials at CDC. We, we've had work at agencies like NIH and the National Cancer Institute. Also, uh, reimbursement discussions at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. But not that many chances to bring all those leaders in our department together to really see how we could work together. If I can say the leaders at SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Services Administration, and also HRSA, Health Resources Service Administration, um, we have pockets of activity, uh, but now a real chance to bring everybody together and see so how do, we can coordinate. Do you this. have a, a working group? Yes, we've, we've met since January, Congressman, and I, I shared those. Dr. Ward has been at every meeting. Um, I should also acknowledge uh, Rosie Henson, our senior advisor, who has been instrumental in launching this. And we have great uh, commitment now across the department, and we're very proud of it. And I realize that, the, that this administration does quite a bit with uh, interagency inter strategies. And how, how has that worked in this case? Well, we, we're going to focus within the department until uh, October, and we get our internal coordination. Um, Heightened, and then we are very eager to work across federal government and then particularly connect with community partners. M many community partners are here today, Congressman, and they've been working on these issues for a long time and they have a lot to teach us. So we're looking forward to working and connecting all interested parties because this issue is so important. Very good. Dr. Ward, uh, according to the recent IOM report, African American adults have the highest rate of acute hepatitis B infection in the United States and the highest rates of acute hepatitis B in infection occur in the South. Uh, what, what does HHS plan on doing to address this population? Uh, 
we have a, an elimination strategy for hepatitis B. We have a, a powerful prevention tool, uh, hepatitis B vaccination. It's safe. It's effective. Uh, the nation committed itself to eliminating uh, transmission of hepatitis B virus uh, way back in 1992. Uh, we have made progress, um, as uh, Representative uh, Cassidy said, that was mainly around children. Um, and over and above the mother to child uh, transmission uh, population that still needs to uh, receive um, fuller attention, the other um, big gap in our uh, immunization strategy is adults at risk for hepatitis B. And those low vaccination coverages are, pro are the major reason that African Americans continue to have high rates of hepatitis uh, okay. B. And and then there, there are many other disparities that exist within uh, this epidemic, including uh, greater rates of infection for many minority groups and the LGBT community. Are there specific strategies in place to address each of these groups? And if so, how, how does it differ? Well, we've put out recommendations um, from CDC to um, that, of which populations among adults need to receive hepatitis B vaccine, such as men who have sex with men, injection drug users, persons with multiple sex partners. Uh, we have, uh, over the last several years, put out about $45 million in money to help public settings, STD clinics, local health departments, uh, correctional uh, in facilities, to um, um, receive hepatitis B vaccine at little or no cost so that that, uh, that vaccine could be used to uh, vaccinate populations which have been shown repeatedly over years to have low coverage, in including the ones I just mentioned. Um, so uh, we would like to uh, continue to advance improvements in vaccine coverage, which would then be followed by declines in hepatitis um, B. Um, and the other aspect of this is that African Americans we'll have also have high rates of hepatitis. Dr. Ward, oh, we have sorry. to cut you real okay. short here okay. because uh, we only have a minute and a half to vote. And uh, of course, he I gives pretty long answers, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what <laughs> happened. <huh? laughs> thank you. We had to cut you short. But anyway, I uh, want to thank both of you for your testimony. Okay. We're going to dismiss you, and of course, um, the uh, committee will be in recess until. 1215, as close to 1215 as we can, that we'll be back. But thank you so much for thank your Thank you, testimony. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Pleasure.